of these inverts. There are two of them uh, for two flavors, trace phi dagger phi and trace phi dagger phi squared. Of course, as we heard uh, a lot uh, in the past days, um, we all know um, that uh, this axial U1 symmetry is broken anomalously. And then we can introduce a third invariant, which only breaks then in addition uh, this, this U1 axial. And this is the famous Hof determinant, um, which in this Masonic language is just the determinant of uh, phi. And uh, if you look through the literature, what people conventionally do is they make then an ansatz for the effective potential, which is which has a part which is a general function of these um, classical chiral invariants, and then a term which is linear and the Othof determinant. And uh, for two flavors, uh, this is a term quadratic in phi. So it gives you an, an anomalous two meson correlation. And, and then famously, uh, this, this is what makes the uh, eta prime heavy. Now, obviously, this is not the most general effective potential because anything that is allowed by symmetries um, is, is part of the effective potential. So in general, not only uh, chi to the one terms, so to Uthof determinant to the one terms, but all, also to the power three, four, and so on, should be in the effective potential. So in general, one has anomalous uh, NF times Q meson correlation, where Q is this power. And uh, so what could this do? Let's just consider a simple example. So this linear sigma model with a classical part here, kinetic term, mass term, and then two uh, quartic interactions. And I neglected higher order terms. And this is the, the kind of the classical part of the action. And then there's an anomalous part where I introduce the ordinary Uthof determinant with the coupling chi one, and then also a square term with a coupling chi two. And then just very simply look at the mass spectrum by just solving uh, uh, the classical equation of motion of the system. So in a simple uh, mean field approximation, and, and this is how it looks like here. I show the meson masses as a function of reduced temperature. So here to the left, we are in the broken phase, and here to the right, um, we are in the chirally symmetric phase. And first, we have no anomaly in quotation marks. Uh, we can easily do this in the model. We can just set chi1 and chi2 to zero. Then we find uh, four Goldstone bosons, the three pions and the eta. And then well, there, there are some masses for the sigma and the A0. And as we uh, approach um, the phase transition, the condensate, the chiral condensate melts, and then all these masses degenerate in the symmetric phase. Now, the, what I call the conventional case, I can switch on a finite chi one and use this to fix the mass of the eta. And in this case, you see that obviously the eta is now not a goldstone anymore. It's, it's split from the pions. And as chiral symmetry is restored, there are still this large splitting um, between the eta and the pion or the A0 and the sigma. So between all of them uh, in the uh, symmetric phase. Now I can also choose a smaller chi one, say much smaller factor of 50 smaller. Then to still get the masses right, I need to switch on a finite chi two. Now chi two is a quartic term uh, for two flavors. So the way it enters the masses is always proportional to the chiral condensate. So as the condensate melts, this contribution to the masses also melts away. And then we end up in this kind of funny situation where it almost looks like in the case without an anomaly, um, where you might want to conclude that the anomaly is somehow restored, but that's not at all the case. It's just stored in the higher order correlation function, um, which doesn't enter the masses in the uh, symmetric phase. So I think that's kind of a curious um, uh, example and also fun thing to play with. But uh, to, to look at this at a more fundamental level, we can ask the question what the microscopic origin of these anomalous correlations are. And uh, well, we heard about this uh, a lot. So uh, we know that the axial anomaly is due to topological non-trivial fluctuations. So if we look at the divergence of the axial current, instead of this being zero, we find that it's uh, proportional to the topological charge density. And we also know that at weak coupling, for instance, at large temperatures, um, these effects are described by instantons. And the superscript Q now denotes the topological charge of the instanton. And typically, uh, instantons with unit topological charge, single instantons are taken into account. And then that's the result of uh, Hof's uh, very impressive paper 
um, that these effects then give rise to anomalous 2NF quark correlation function, which is this Hof determinant, but now written in terms of uh, quark fields, not mesons. So these indices F and G are uh, flavor indices. This determinant is over flavor. And then you have a right-handed projection operator here, which stems from the instanton contributions, so top positive topological charge, and then the left-handed contribution for anti-instantons with negative topological charge. And then in addition, the distribution of topological charge uh, in QCD is uh, characterized by the theta-dependent free energy. And uh, with single instantons, you find that it's, uh, this is proportional just to a cosine of theta. Okay, so what uh, one might ask then is, if, is there a similar story for these higher order anomalous correlations I've used in my examples of this determinant squared, for example, or to turn this around, what about instantons with higher topological charge? And, and this is the topic of my talk. And what I am going to show is that they, as a direct generalization of a Toft's result, give rise to anomalous 2 and F times Q quark correlation functions. So, so this indeed gives you then just determinant to the power Q contributions. And I will just outline the derivation. It's, it's, it's quite technical. I will I try to just give you the basic idea. And uh, then multi-instantons also yield corrections to the theta dependence of QCD. So instead of just having a cosine theta, you now have to consider a sum over all topological charges um, uh, with a cosine of topological charge times theta. And what I will do is basically compute this coefficient here. And then um, to make a connection to, to Maria's uh, nice talk yesterday, um, I, I will look at uh, the implication for topological susceptibilities and then also explore possible effects for axion dark matter. But I'll, I'll explain this towards the end of my talk. Um, so kind of a disclaimer already. Um, I will compute in a controlled limit, which is a semi-classical approximation uh, uh, that is only valid at small coupling or large temperatures. And I use this uh, controlled limit to derive uh, effects that are induced by higher topological charge. Now, at the same time, in this limit, um, these effects are small, but the whole purpose of this exercise is, is that you can show that these effects are there. And then how, how large they might be at lower energies or temperatures is something that I will not answer in this talk, but it's more about the fundamental question of, of deriving effects. Okay, so some background, I think I can be quick here, um, um, given all the previous talks. So uh, we have already learned that safe dual gauge fields uh, minimize the classical action of young mills theory under the requirement that the solution has finite action. And uh, one example of these safe dual gauge fields are instantons or anti-instantons if they have negative topological charge. And as uh, Guy uh, beautifully explained yesterday, um, they can be characterized um, by their topological charge, uh, this thing here, which is an integer. And we also heard from Antonio, he mentioned already the, uh, the explicit BPST solution for topological charge one, which I show here um, in the singular gauge. And the only thing I want you to remember here is that it depends on these uh, three parameters, u1, rho1, and z1. So u1 uh, characterizes the orientation of the instanton in the gauge group. So it's a global SUNC matrix. Then rho1 is a scalar, um, which uh, characterizes the size of the instanton. And z1 is a four vector uh, describing its location in space time. So if uh, we have quarks in a topological background. We also know that they acquire zero modes. So here I just write down the, the Dirac operator in the background of a multi instanton and, and then the, the quark on this operator has zero modes. I also denote then the zero modes with the superscript. And we also know that uh, the number of left and right handed, the difference between them um, of left and right handed zero modes uh, is related to the topological charge. And kind of as a corollary to this index theorem, if you have uh, self dual gauge fields, uh, then you only have left handed uh, zero modes and anti self dual, uh, so negative topological charge, you only get uh, right handed zero modes. Okay, so the, the, the basics really quick. So, what I want to do now is to compute the partition function in a multi instanton background. So, First, we need to get the ingredients, which are the instantons themselves and the zero modes for the, the quark zero modes. 
And then I do a semi-classical computation where I consider small fluctuations around a multi-instanton background. So this was also mentioned yesterday. There's a systematic construction to get a general instanton solutions with arbitrary topological charge known as the ADHM construction. And what this basically does is it reduces um, the, the classical self-dual Young Mills equation to a set of nonlinear algebraic equations. And even though this is a somewhat simpler problem, there still um, uh, do not exist known solutions for larger topological charges. So to tackle this problem here, I will resort to approximations. And for this, I will exploit one other fact of about instantons that, that will play a crucial role here, namely that a multi-instanton with charge Q, a Q instanton, can be viewed as a composition of a constituents, constituent instanton with unit topological charge. So this blob here is, an, is a multi-instanton. And if you look at this more closely, you can think uh, about this as somehow a collection of these constituents. And this is why I mentioned this before. Each of these constituents have their own location, orientation in the gauge group and size. And these are known then as the instanton collective coordinates. And if you count how many are there for general SUNC gauge group, you find that there are four NC times Q uh, collective coordinates. And these coordinates arise from uh, symmetries of the system that yield inequivalent instanton solutions. So for example, so for example, translations give rise to this location, dilatations give rise uh, to this size and so on. Now, um, I want to solve the, the ADHM by expanding in the limit of small constituent instantons. So I assume that the um, relative distance between all the constituents is much larger than their respective size. So instead of considering an, a multi-instanton, which looks like this, it's, uh, it looks more like this. And then um, one can work out the ADHM systematically in an expansion in the, the size over the separation and to order four. The instanton itself, the solution has been found by Chris Weinbeck and Stanton in, in 78. And the solution is basically just a sum over uh, these constituent instantons, so each with uh, charge one and their, or their individual uh, coordinates, and then a factor which ties all of them together. So they, they kind of still see each other and they are not independent. And then- Excuse uh, me, the Fabian. Zero, yeah. In the chat, Joseph Samuel asked if you're working in the dilute instanton limit. I, I just interrupted you because I, I thought it'd be- Oh yes, so I will come to this. Yeah, I will. I mean, at this point, um, I, I just consider a single instanton, so I don't, you know, a single multi-instanton, so, so I don't have to do a dilute instanton. That's the dilute instanton limit comes in, and I will, I will do this in a bit when I consider many instantons. But this is now I'm just discussing one multi-instanton. Um, so, but yeah, I will, I will a little bit later. Um, okay, and then. Yeah, the quark zero modes, there are um, few quark zero modes for each flavor. And this is what uh, Rob and I have worked out also in the same order as this gluent field. And also there you basically find that it's the sum of uh, zero modes for each as a constituent instanton. And then there are factors which are tying them together. The, the details don't really matter. That's just one thing I, I want you to remember that if you go far away from the center of the instanton, then these zero modes just look like free quark propagators. And I will, I will use this fact uh, in a bit. So uh, these are our ingredients. Now uh, we compute the partition function. So this is just an ordinary partition function. We have a path integral over our fields, uh, gluons, quarks, and the gauge fixed setting. So there are also ghosts. Then this is the classical action of QCD in the chiral limit in, a, in the background of an instanton. And then I separated out this quark anti quark term uh, with this general source. So if you think about ordinary QCD, this source would just be a mass term. And then I want to consider small fluctuations around this multi instanton background. Um, but I mentioned that these collective coordinates correspond to symmetries of the system. So there will be zero modes also for the gauge fields. And since fluctuations in directions of uh, the zero modes don't cost any energy, uh, we cannot assume uh, fluctuations to be small there. So in these directions, 
um, they need to be treated exactly. And this can be done by replacing an, the integral over zero modes by an integral over these collective coordinates. And then you can write formally um, the partition function like this. Here, your integral measure is just a product, product of uh, integrations over the collective coordinates of the individual constituents. And then there's the instanton density, which just uh, summarizes basically a, a bunch of effects that it uh, contributions it's, it contains. So it contains the, uh, the functional determinant for gluons and goals, then also the quark determinant over the um, non-zero modes, because I want to treat the zero mode separately. And then since we made this uh, coordinate change from zero modes to collective coordinates, there's a corresponding Jacobian, which is also in this instant density. And then there's the zero mode determinant, which since it's zero modes, uh, um, it only hits the source. And, and uh, this, this then looks like this. And uh, so now since we have this integration, um, these integrations over um, all the constituent instanton locations, there are qualitatively different contributions to the partition function. So, so one contribution is that all these uh, constituents are far apart and then they just look like uh, a collection of single instantons. So this, this looks just like dilute single instantons. And in this case, the uh, partition function factorizes just into single instanton contributions um, and this Q factorial arises because they are identical particles. And since you can move each of these constituents around in space time um, individually, this, um, this contribution goes parametrically like space time volume to the power Q. So this is a non-local contribution to your partition function. However, since they can be anywhere, there's this particular configuration where they all lump together like this. And this uh, is what I call a genuine multi-instanton contribution, delta ZQ. And this now only depends on the average location of this multi-instanton and therefore parametrically uh, goes like volume to the one. And this then, this is a local contribution to the partition function. So we have various non-local contributions that you could identify with contributions from instantons with lower topological charge. And they're in they're one local uh, contribution so you can, you can just split the, the uh, partition function up into these different contributions. And to get something local, um, um, I just want to compute this genuine contribution. So, and um, uh, the, what we did is we only considered the contribution of the quark zero mode determinant to this. Uh, and, and you can show that this is accurate again uh, to order um, size over separation to the four. So considering the gauge part, uh, of this computation. And then just I just show you the result. Um, uh, what you find is that you have a product over the contribution of all the um, constituents. So they each have their own instanton density and their own quark zero mode determinant. But then crucially, there's just one integration here, which corresponds to the integration of the average uh, location of the multi-instanton. This is what I've mentioned before. Every other contribution would have a bunch of integrals over a bunch of locations here. And then there's, uh, there's some factor um, um, that you can work out analytically. And, and it, this just depends on all the constituent sizes and the number of flavors. And, and you can find all the gory details of this kind of technical computation in this paper. But let me rather give you an intuitive picture. And for this, I exploit that luckily um, uh, we know the single instanton density because it has been computed in the vacuum by Ethoft and by uh, one of our esteemed organizers a few years later at finer temperature. And here I show the instanton density as a function of the size multiplied with the renormalization scale. And then you see that you find this, uh, this peak function here. This is the vacuum solution. And then as you uh, increase the temperature, there's screening and that kind of um, then melts away this this peak here. And if you, if you have such a peak, you might want to interpret this as an effective size of your constituent instanton. And then this, this problem of finding uh, the, this multi-instanton solution is kind of a geometric problem because you just want, you have these individual constituent instantons and you want to pick out the, uh, the contribution where they kind of geometrically overlap. So this geometric overlap 
has to go like the effective size to the power four because it's a space time kind of effective volume then of the single of this constituent instanton and then to the power q minus one. And then indeed, if you uh, with this row bar just um, look at this solution in this way, then you find that uh, it, it, it has this kind of pretty easy to understand form where you have one space time volume factor from this integration over the um, average location of the multi instanton. And then this uh, contribution just of these Q single instantons weighted with their geometric uh, overlap. Okay. And you could even go one step further and make this even simpler. Um, and just notice that you know it, it seems like the um, the size is always proportional to the effective size to one over the uh, uh, renormization scale. So to get something parametrically, uh, you 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 can also just um, you know estimate this with an expression like this. So but this is kind of this is a rigorous con uh, computation, and this is just kind of a, kind of an intuitive result to understand a little better um, what we got. So. So we know this delta ZQ now. I mentioned these correlation functions and to understand how they arise, um, um, we can exploit this large distance behavior of the zero modes I just mentioned so that they, if you're far away from the center, they just look like free quark propagators. And then uh, the determinant, this zero mode determinant basically looks like a collection of, uh, so pairs of quark propagators which connect the source to the constituent instantons. So you could make a sketch of this for three flavors and a topological charge two, where you have these two constituents and these red dots are the source locations and the, these lines are just the core propagators. So you get something that looks like such a correlation function. And indeed within this picture, you can show that data that Q I have uh, just derived is identical to an effective partition function which makes no reference to instantons. So you again have this path integral, um, but now there's no instanton background. Rather, you have this effective action. Though keep in mind, this is downstairs here. It's not in the exponential. So it's not yet a proper effective action. But if you work this all out, uh, it turns out that this effective action looks exactly like the Petrov determinant to the power Q. And this is what comes out if you uh, do the computation with uh, um, multi instanton with topological charge Q. If you do this with an anti instanton, you get a left handed projection operator here. And then this coupling is related to, to, to this expression here. Um, and uh, uh, again, once again, you only you have a local contribution, so just one uh, integration over kind of the location of this vertex, if you wish, um, because we picked out this multi, this genuine multi instanton contribution. Is there, I think there's another question in the chat. Oh yeah, was your multi instanton ansatz not only valid in some limit? Yeah, it's it's valid in this limit where I assume that the um, the size, uh, the, the separation is large against the sizes. And this is true for all these results. So it's- in Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the question is, okay. Then uh, that I would call the dilute. Okay, because you say the separation is much bigger than the size. Okay, that, well, that is what I would call a dilute gas, right? And, and your approximation is that. But then when you integrate, no, you forget about that, right? You, you integrate over all values. No, no, no. All, all the distances uh, all of, the, of the locations, you said on top of each other, which is certainly not within the, the, the degree of approximation that you're using. Okay. No, no, you can I mean, say there, there, there is you a, can... your answer is only valid in one limit, but then when you treat later the, um, the collective coordinates, you forget about that. <laughs> and you integrate no, 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 all. No, so, uh, uh, maybe no, no, not, yeah, okay, maybe, so maybe so I understood that, wrongly, yeah. okay? Yeah, but it's very, yeah, so you the, said uh, it's very difficult because you, you need the ADHM solution to do it properly. Yeah. You need yeah. really the ADHM solution, which you don't have. Yeah. And, I, and I what have, you have, have is an approximation have, for dilute, dilute uh, instantons because when the separation is much bigger than the size, that is what I would call dilute gas, okay? And okay, so, so your, your approximation is valid in this dilute gas. You're adding, by the way, the, the fields in, in the singular gauge, 
as I said yesterday, they should be done. <laughs> That's correct. Because, yeah. So, uh, but uh, with this normalization, which is needed, it's so, but, but I think uh, at some stage you forget that the formula you're using has a limitation. Uh, I don't know, maybe I understood well, wrongly, I, but well, then, then, then you integrate over all values. I, I understand your point. So, um, the, all the results are show, I show are valid in this limit, but, but first of all, the, this approximation I use is an approximation of the ADHM solution. And the, what is the, the kind of, if you are in the dilute limit, then, then you would, for instance, if you think about the quarks and remotes in, the, in what you call the dilute uh, limit, they wouldn't even see each other. The, you, have a, you have a zero mode for each of these constituents um, and they wouldn't even see each other. And then you get the, then you are in the proper dilute limit. But at, at the higher order in this expansion, which you can do, I mean, I just, I just, I, I mean, it's technical, so I skipped it, but it's an expansion of this exact ADHM solution. Um, then, then you find that there's kind of an overlap, if you wish, of these constituents, and they give you these corrections. And that's not a, that's, if you wish, it's a, correction to the dilute limit, which is valid up to this order in the expansion. Of course, right. they cannot sit on top of each other, and but there's still a limit where there are, they are cleanly separated so that this assumption is valid, yet they see each other. And this is the, their, that, that is the scale of where my results are valid. And that's a correction. Well, you, you should compute the correction in any case and see if it matters, for example. To the yeah, next is, yeah, yeah, but the, I, Okay. This is what I have done. I, I compute this correction here. This is exactly what I've okay. done. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, sure. No, don't know. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, okay. Where was I? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I was at this. So we had this uh, kind of effective correlation function, um, which uh, already looks uh, very nice. But then, of course, uh, uh, we are not done yet because. What I've done so far is to consider the partition function in the background of one multi-instanton, but obviously all possible gluon configurations contribute. And now I assume I have a dilute gas, but not a dilute gas of just single instantons, but a dilute gas of multi-instantons. And such an approximation is reasonable at a large enough temperatures because of this thermal uh, screening. So instantons, this is what Raup has shown, are uh, small at large temperatures. So, so if you look at the screening, there's one contribution, which is basically the bias screening, where you could estimate that then at large temperatures, the instantons are always smaller than one over pi t. And now we have this instanton density for each constituent. So this limit is also valid in our case. Now the path integral uh, involves integrations over all these locations. Um, so there must be these genuine multi-instanton corrections to the dilute gas. And this is, this, is, this is what this delta ZQ uh, gives me. So I consider a statistical ensemble of these genuine multi instanton contributions. And there it's important that I only computed the correction to the dilute limit, because if I would also include now for ZQ all these lower topological charge contributions, if I do this statistical ensemble, I would just overcount. But now I, I know the correction, I put it in a dilute gas, and then you basically just exponentiate these delta ZQs. Um, okay. Now, if you do this for the um, for this um, for this effective partition function, then you exponentiate this effective action, and this promotes it to a proper effective action because it actually corrects um, the you know the QCD action, if you wish. And then you have what I uh, was asking in the beginning that you see that from multi instantons, these determinant to the power Q terms arise in a local fashion. And so you get in general anomalous 2NF times Q correlation functions. And indeed, if you would bosonize them for Q equals one and two, you get back to uh, my simple linear sigma model example um, I, I mentioned in the beginning. So, so the bottom line here is that the axial anomaly is encoded in higher order correlation function. I think this is a pretty obvious statement. At least to me, far less obvious is the statement that their microscopic origin is instantons with higher topological charge. And of course, one could look, use this to look uh, for new signatures of the anomaly in, in quark and hadron correlations. But I want to do uh, something a little bit different. I want to make a connection to uh, Maria's nice talk yesterday and talk about the theta dependence and topological susceptibilities. So um, I can also be quick here 
Because of topology, we basically have to add this theta term to the QCD Lagrangian. And this is proportion, this theta is an actual free parameter. Now, since this contribution is, is proportional to the topological charge density in the Lagrangian, um, uh, incorporating this in the dilute gas is pretty straightforward, just simply by doing the substitution of delta ZQ to delta ZQ times E to the I Q theta. Do the sum again, and then uh, what you find for the free energy for the theta dependent free energy, so the log of the partition function, is also what I've shown in the beginning. It's a sum over all topological charges um, cosine uh, charge times theta. And this coefficient now comes from this, this genuine multi instanton contribution, um, which we now know. But I mean, then still with, the, with kind of the, the rigorous result in, in this small constituent instanton limit, evaluating this for all Q is, um, is, uh, is, is, is in a closed form is not possible. So what I will rather use is this intuitive result I've shown because then it's something I can just incorporate all topological charges analytically and get a closed expression. If I do this, the free energy becomes this, uh, this funky function here, um, where this is now the normalized uh, free energy. So it's zero at theta equals zero. Okay. And if this Z1 here um, is uh, small, then uh, you just recover the, the result you get from single instantons, so this cosine theta term, but now multi instantons modify this behavior. And here I plot the free energy as a function of theta. I just plug in some numbers for Z1. It doesn't have to be realistic or anything, but just to show you what can happen in principle is that the darkest line here is just the basic cosine behavior uh, you get from single instantons. But if these multi instanton effects become important, then you can drastically deform the potential and get this kind of flower-like looking figure. Um, but still, you know, you still have an even function in theta and it's still two pi periodic. It's just uh, modified. Okay, so what do these modifications do for that? I want to look at the topological susceptibilities we heard about yesterday. Um, and so since um, the free energy describes the distribution of topological charges, we can characterize this by, by their susceptibilities, which are just derivatives of F with respect to theta. And this gives you connected correlators of topological charge. Now, due to the simple cosine behavior, if you are in a dilute single instanton gas, all these susceptibilities are proportional to the lowest susceptibility chi two. Uh, this is not the case anymore with multi instanton effects. They all, uh, they all get, they all have like genuinely different uh, values. Uh, you can actually also write it down in closed form. I, I don't know why I didn't do this. Okay. But the, here the point is in general that we find that these corrections are always positive in the limit that we are computing and they, they in general enhance topological correlations, which maybe is also kind of intuitive. Um, so, but instead of looking at these chi's directly, um, I want to look at the deviation from the lowest susceptibility because there it's most apparent. Excuse um, me, Fabian, you have five minutes left. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, and these are the unharmonicity coefficients. Um, Ma Maria also mentioned yesterday. So higher susceptibilities divided by lower susceptibilities. So for single instantons, they are constant. Uh, for multi instantons, they can become temperature dependent. And I just study this now in, in the quench limit of QCD, um, where I assume that the quark mass, masses are of the order of one over this effective instanton size, basically. So they're not dynamical. And here's B2 as a function of T with uh, single instantons only, uh, as, as I said, it's constant, but with multi instantons, you see that it, it goes down uh, in temperature as the temperature decreases. Now, in principle, this can also be measured on the lattice, but I, I understand that it's a, it's a very hard problem. Um, so I put, pick here a, a result of a very nice uh, calculation by Bonatti and friends. Um, and uh, there, if you look at large temperatures, uh, there's at least the tendency uh, that this B2 also goes down. But of course, there's a huge grain of salt because this is not continuum extrapolated. And uh, uh, so, so I wouldn't dare to make any conclusions at this point, but I think it's pretty interesting to see that um, we might be able to understand these qualitative features of, uh, of the distribution of topological charges with multi-instantons, but they might require some pretty 
are um, um, accurate lattice measurements. So then I very quickly, uh, there's another application Guy just mentioned this shortly yesterday, which is axions. And, and I, I give you like my one minute introduction. Uh, and originally they have been um, introduced with this Peche Quinn mechanism to solve the CP problem, which Maria uh, also talked about yesterday. So what you just do, you, you add to the standard model another global axial U1 charge and add scalars which are coupled to quarks and charged under this U1. Then this U1 is spontaneously broken. You get a Goldstone boson, and this is known as the axion. And since this U1 is anomalous, um, it turns out that all the, so the effective potential, the non-derivative couplings of this axion are completely determined by the anomaly. And if you work this out, the axions enter the Lagrangian exactly in the same way as the theta parameter. So you can just shift the axion by a constant, which is theta, and then you get a dynamical theta angle. And since we know the theta dependent free energy now, we already know the effective potential of the axion. Well, and what determines the physical uh, value of, of, of a field, um, well, where its minimum is uh, in the effective potential, and for the axion effective potential, then it's, it's at zero. So it's a very neat resolution of the strong CP problem. And incidentally, it's also a good dark matter candidate if uh, they are very light and weakly coupled to, this, to the standard model. And I want to uh, study the production of axion dark matter through something called vacuum realignment. So the simplest realizations, again, uh, very quick. We assume that this patchy quin symmetry is broken before inflation. So before inflation, topology doesn't play a role. The axion is uh, essentially massless and fluctuates heavily. Uh, this is uh, here some spatial scale. Now inflation happens. You pick out one slice of this axion field, you stretch it over the whole size of the horizon or the universe maybe. So right after inflation, you are end up with some random initial homogeneous value for the axion. And this vacuum realignment is then just the time evolution of the axion from this initial value until today. And then this can be done by just solving Einstein's equations. And if you work this out in a simple Friedman universe, you get this simple uh, looking time evolution equation for the axion. This is the Hubble parameter con, um, determining the expansion of the universe. This is the axion effective potential. And if you look at this, um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, this is just, uh, looks like a damped harmonic oscillator and there are two regimes. If H is much smaller than V prime prime, so basically the axion mass, which happens at early times, you are in the overdamped regime from this, of this oscillator and the axion will be frozen in time. And at later times, this will be reversed uh, and the Hubble um, parameter is smaller than the mass. The oscillators in the underdamped regime, you can basically forget about the damping and you oscillate around the minimum. And then you can already guess what I'm getting at with these multi-instanton effects. The orange one is the single instanton uh, potential and this one is the one you get with multi-instantons. And it can happen that for instance, the potential is much flatter around uh, the maxima. So if you have an initial value, which is close, say, to the maxima, it, with multi-instantons, you might, may stay longer, longer in the overdamped regime. And then you can just look what it does, for instance, for the dark matter energy of axions to tell you how much dark matter, axion dark matter we have. And here I show this, the axion field as a function of temperature, uh, time, sorry. And indeed, I, I picked the value close to this maximum for illustration. And then indeed, it's uh, first in this overdamped regime. And then because of these multi-instanton effects, um, the axon enters later the uh, underdamped regime. And as a result, it will accumulate during its time evolution more potential energy. And this is then what determines basically the energy density in the end. And you see that you can at later times have more axion dark matter uh, with these multi-instanton effects compared to having only single instanton, instanton effects. So I think that's kind of a very neat mechanism and, uh, and uh, uh, just uh, as a kind of just final discussion to end this, of course, the size of all the effects I mentioned here depend on the size of multi-instanton effects. Classically, uh, they are exponentially suppressed and then there's additional suppression of the instanton density because of light quarks. So obviously quantum corrections are crucial. How can we address this? First of all, go to 
better understand this delta ZQ, which would mean computing systematically higher orders in this, uh, in this small constituent uh, instanton um, expansion I've used. And something I haven't talked about at all is that of course instantons and in particular instantons and anti-instantons can also interact with each other. And maybe you want to then consider something like a multi-instanton liquid. But of course, eventually the semi liquid picture breaks down at stronger coupling. This may inc incidentally also be when all these effects become important. But, but the whole point of this exercise is that with this semi-classical analysis, you can actually systematically derive all these effects. So they must be there. Um, and then my summary is just the slide uh, that I've shown uh, uh, in the beginning. So, so I, I just stop here and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Fabian, for this very really great talk. And so we are open to questions. Please, uh, please feel free to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I see a hand. Anirban, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so I was wondering, um, um, so we knew earlier that this TOOF determinant gives two times NF interaction, two times NF quark interaction. So that's why in the four Fermi interaction, for two flavor, it doesn't do something great, but the, starting from three, it, it started contributing in a different way. But uh, when you, uh, yeah. when you uh, show that this uh, multi-instanton picture gets this contribution determinant to the Q, and then this becomes two NF times Q quark interactions, I was wondering, yeah. I mean, you showed the effect in the topological susceptibility um, mm -hmm. that the ratio not being one, rather a temperature dependent of the yeah. consecutive order. But what is the, if, if at all any effect is there in the, I mean, for example, the effective masses of your degrees of freedom of, of this quantity, because in principle, in, a, in any chiral approach, we, uh, we, we get this, right? I mean, the effective masses are being moderated by various contributions on, I mean, is there any? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is basically if you if you just work this out in the in the in the low energy, uh, in, in some low energy model, you get exactly what I studied in the beginning, right? You get some That's corrections correct. to the masses from these higher order anomalous correlation functions. But since they are higher order, you only really see them in the currently broken phase because the contribution melts down. At least you know, in the mean field picture. Of course, if you if you have loop corrections. Uh, then, then it might be a little bit different, but um, yeah. But, but yeah, in principle, you could you could think about these effects for for masses also in other cases. So, for instance, for one flavor, you would from the normal determinant you get a chiral condensate, but with topological charge two, you would actually get a mass term in one flavor QCD. Or maybe in two flavor QCD, you could get an anomalous mass for uh, for tetra quarks or something like that. I haven't, we haven't played around with this really with the possibilities, but I think it, it, it would be a fun thing to explore masses, uh, the effect on masses or also general, general correlations from these higher order terms. Okay, thank you, thank you. Is there any quick question for Fabian? Um, I don't uh, see any. So thanks a lot, Fabian, for this great talk again.